Bonjour et merci de vous être rejoints à nous aujourd'hui. Je souhaite rappeler aux Canadiens que, même avec la longue fin de semaine qui commence, nous devons tous continuer à pratiquer la distinction physique. Ne gâchons pas nos gains. So let me just start by reminding everyone, by reminding all Canadians, that even with a long weekend ahead of us, which is great, we all need to continue practicing physical distancing. Let's be so careful not to squander our hard-won gains. So today, we will hear from Canada's Chief Public Health Officer, Dr. Theresa Tam, the Deputy Chief Public Health Officer, Dr. Howard New, and by video link, the Minister of Innovation, Science and Industry, Navdeep Baines, and also by video link, the Minister of Finance, Bill Morneau. And of course, our Minister of Health, Patty Haidu, is here as well to answer questions. Dr. Tam, please. Good afternoon. Bonjour à toutes et à tous. I will start with the latest numbers on COVID-19 in Canada. There are now 73,829 confirmed cases, including 5,499 deaths and 36,528 cases, or 49 percent, have now recovered. Labs across Canada have tested over 1,232,000 people for COVID-19 to date, with about 6% of these testing positive overall. We are now testing an average of 26 to 28,000 people daily. These numbers change quickly and are updated regularly on canada.ca slash coronavirus. With many areas of the country continuing to show decreased COVID-19 activity, and the Victoria Day long weekend just ahead of us, getting outside is top of mind. By the same token, there are many Canadians who are concerned about how we can go about these next weeks and months safely. This is a very reasonable concern. The reality is that COVID-19 is still out there and it will be with us for the foreseeable future. So as local authorities continue to slowly reopen recreational, social and economic spaces, the right and safest way to go out is to go out smart. This means not dropping the vital layers of protection that we've used to plank the curve and by now have well ingrained as our hygiene habits. Going out smart means keeping two metres of physical distancing from others wherever and whenever possible, avoiding touching common surfaces and cleaning our hands well and frequently. And depending on the COVID activity in your area, Local authorities may recommend the use of non-medical masks or facial coverings as an added layer of protection for when it is not possible for you to maintain a two-metre distance from others, for example, when using public transit. However, in some instances, going out is not OK. We all have a responsibility to do things to keep others safe and to not risk a setback on the progress we've made. That means covering every cough and sneeze but for those who are experiencing even mild symptoms consistent with COVID-19, it also means staying home and staying apart from others. So no matter where we are this long weekend, going out should only be an option if we can go out smart. Living with COVID-19 means we've got to maintain our habits of physical distancing, fre frequent hand washing and staying home if sick. Thank you. Merci. Thank you very much, Dr. Tam. Et maintenant, je donne la parole à Dr. Howard New. Dr. New, s'il vous plaît. Merci. Bonjour. Comme d'habitude, je commencerai avec le nombre de cas de COVID-19 au Canada. Il y a maintenant 73 829 cas confirmés, dont 5 499 décès et 36 528 personnes rétablies, soit 49 Jusqu'à ce jour, des laboratoires partout au Canada ont analysé les tests de dépistage de la COVID-19 de plus de 1 232 000 personnes. Environ 6 d'entre elles ont obtenu un résultat positif. En moyenne, de 26 000 à 28 000 personnes sont soumises à un test de dépistage chaque jour. Ces chiffres changent rapidement et sont mis régulièrement à jour dans le site canada.ca oblique le trait d'union coronavirus. Puisque l'activité relative à la COVID-19 demeure à la baisse d'eau dans beaucoup de régions du pays et que la longue fin de semaine est à nos portes, 
sortir prendre l'air est une priorité. Cela dit, beaucoup de Canadiens sont préoccupés par notre capacité à demeurer, demeurer en sécurité dans les semaines et mois à venir, ce qui est tout à fait compréhensible. En fait, la COVID-19 est toujours présente et le demeurera dans un avenir prévisible. Donc, pendant que les autorités locales poursuivent la lente réouverture des espaces récréatifs, sociaux et économiques, la façon la plus sûre de sortir est de le faire prudemment. Il faut donc maintenir les mesures de protection essentielles utilisées jusqu'ici pour aplatir la courbe et qui font désormais partie intégrante de nos habitudes d'hygiène. Par sortir prudemment, on entend maintenir un éloignement physique de deux mètres dans la mesure de possible, éviter de toucher aux surfaces communes et bien se laver les mains et souvent. Et, selon l'activité relative à la COVID-19 dans votre région, les autorités locales peuvent recommander le port d'un masque non médical ou d'un couvre-visage comme mesure de protection supplémentaire quand il n'est pas possible de maintenir deux mètres de distance, par exemple dans les transports en commun. Toutefois, il arrive que sortir ne soit pas recommandé. Nous avons tous la responsabilité de garder les autres en sécurité, de ne prendre aucun risque qui pourrait provoquer le recul des progrès ré réalisés. Cela signifie de couvrir notre bouche chaque fois que nous toussons ou éternuons et, dans le, dans le cas des personnes qui ont des symptômes très faibles apparentés à ceux de la COVID-19, cela signifie également de rester à la maison et loin des autres. Donc, peu importe où vous vous trouvez pendant cette longue fin de semaine, vous devriez sortir seulement si vous pouvez le faire prudemment. Pour cohabiter avec la COVID-19, il faut maintenir l'éloignement physique, se laver les mains souvent et rester à la maison quand nous sommes malades. Merci. Merci, Dr. Knu. And now we will hear from our Minister of Innovation, Science and Industry, Navdeep Baines. Nav, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Christia. Over the past month, our government has been working hard to make sure that all Canadians can keep food on the table and a roof over their heads. We've made changes to our employment insurance program, introduced the Canada Emergency Response Benefit, and provided a wage subsidy for business owners to avert layoffs. Today, we're announcing a new program that will provide temporary support for Canada's research talent, help sustain research capacity at universities and health research institutes during these extraordinary times. Aujourd'hui, nous annonçons un programme temporaire visant à soutenir les chercheurs canadiens de talent et la capacité de recherche des universités et des instituts de recherche de santé durant cette période. Canada's universities and health research institutes employ tens of thousands of highly qualified research personnel. I'm talking about the researchers, lab technicians, trainees, and other support personnel who are the driving force for Canada's research, both universities and health research institutes like the Sick Kids Research Institute in Toronto and the Montreal Clinical Research Institute. These people are significant drivers of innovation. They generate the discoveries and inventions that help people and the economy. Many of these very researchers have the expertise we need to help us better understand COVID-19 and how to fight it. But these highly qualified personnel are at risk of being laid off right now. Non-government sources of revenue like private sector contracts, charitable donations and endowments, which account for much of the income that funds the research activities of universities and health research institutes, are drying up due to the COVID-19 crisis. To help them, we will be providing up to $450 million to help sustain the academic research community through the crisis caused by COVID-19. Nous annonçons jusqu'à 450 millions de dollars pour soutenir le milieu de la richesse universitaire et de la santé durant la crise de la COVID-19. 
all Canadian universities, health research institutes, eligible for federal granting funding, are also eligible for this program in support of their research-related activities. In addition to providing wage support for research personnel, this investment will also help universities and health research institutes cover the unanticipated costs associated with maintaining research assets at risk due to the pandemic and ramping up research activities once physical distancing measures are relaxed and ultimately lifted. Cet investissement s'ajoute aux mesures que nous avons mises en place pour maintenir les emplois et l'excellence en matière de sciences et de recherche au Canada. It's absolutely critical that we support and retain our research talent, not only because they are Canadians that need our help right now, but also to ensure that our universities, health research institutes, have the talent and knowledge necessary to support post-pandemic economic recovery. Years ago, we made the single largest investment in fundamental research in Canadian history. That is because this government recognizes the value of the work done by scientists and researchers in this country. And it is in that spirit that we stand with them today. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Okay, thank you very much, Nav. And I will just ask our technicians, uh, perhaps, uh, to turn up the volume if you can. Uh, it hasn't been a perfect transmission. Um, and Bill, I will ask you if you don't mind to speak a little bit slowly because the transmission is, uh, there's a little bit of static on it. So I think if you speak slowly and we turn up the volume, our chances of understanding every word will be improved. Okay, so now we're going to hear from our finance minister, Bill Morneau. Bill, please. Well, thank you, Christia. I think, as we all know, we've been working hard over the last uh, months to protect jobs. We introduced the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy to do just that. To date, the uh, wage subsidy is helping almost 2 million workers across Canada, and thousands of applications are being received every single day. Well, provinces are slowly starting to uh, change away from lockdown procedures. We know that businesses continue to need support to keep workers on payroll or even to rehire them as things pick up. That's why our government has announced that we will extend the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy to August 29th, 2020. We plan on consulting with businesses and labour representatives over the course of the next month and any potential adjustments that we make following the consultation period, including possible adjustments to the revenue decline threshold, will seek to promote jobs and promote growth. Notre, notre gouvernement a annoncé son intention de prolonger la subvention salariale d'urgence du Canada jusqu'au 29 août 2020. Nous consulterons les représentants d'entreprises et les syndicats au corps du mois prochain. Tout potentiel ajustement que nous ferons après la période de consultation, y compris les ajustements possibles au seuil de base de revenus, visera à promouvoir l'emploi et la croissance économique. We're also making changes so that more workers and more organizations can benefit from the wage subsidy. New regulations are effective immediately and retroactive to March 15th. Wage subsidy is now available to registered journalism organizations and all registered Canadian amateur athletic associations. This includes Hockey Canada, Lacrosse Canada, and others. Also eligible now are tax-exempt Indigenous-owned corporations and partnerships that include Indigenous governments and eligible employers. This will ensure more Indigenous employers can support their workers. And non-public colleges and schools are now eligible, including driving schools and language schools, and art schools, which foster Canada's world-class talent, like the National Ballet School, for example. Wage subsidy will also be available to partnerships with non-eligible members, as long as the non-eligible members are not majority owners. Nous faisons aussi des changements afin que 
plus de travailleurs dans plus d'organisations puissent bénéficier de la subvention. Les nouveaux règlements entrent en vigueur immédiatement et seront rétroactifs au 15 mars. La subvention est maintenant disponible pour les organisations de journalisme enregistrées, toutes les associations canadiennes enregistrées de sport amateur, les collèges et, et écoles non publiques, y compris les écoles de langue et les écoles de conduite. We also intend to propose legislation to provide greater flexibility for employers to use the wage subsidy to rehire and support workers who may not have been regular employees in the early months of this year, but are nonetheless important to operations. Workers like seasonal employees. Nous avons également l'intention de faire des modifications législatives pour donner aux employeurs une plus grande flexibilité dans l'utilisation de la subvention. Ils seraient ainsi capables de réembaucher et soutenir les travailleurs qui n'étaient peut-être pas dans des employés réguliers au cours des premiers mois de cette année, comme par exemple dans le cas des travailleurs saisonniers. We also want to ensure that the wage subsidy applies appropriately to corporations formed on the amalgamation of two predecessor organizations. My message to employers remains the same. We hope that you apply to this program and rehire your workers. While much remains unknown, there's one thing that I do know. Workers drive our economy. By making sure that they have jobs to go back to, we're making sure that Canada stands ready to recover. Thank you very much. Back to you, Christian. Okay. Thank you very much, Bill. Et nous sommes maintenant prêts à répondre à vos questions. Carl, s'il vous plaît. Merci, Madame la Vice-Première Ministre. So, as usual, we'll start with three questions on the phone, one question, one follow-up, and then we will turn to the room. Operator, over to you. Thank you. Merci. Please press star one at this time if you have a question. Puis, s'il vous plaît, appuyez sur étoile 1 maintenant pour poser une question. The first question, la première question, est de Mélanie Marquis de la Presse. À vous la parole. Merci. Euh, bonjour. Ma première question est pour euh, M. Morneau. Euh, combien, à combien est-ce que euh, ça va... Euh, de, de, pardon, je recommence. Combien va coûter le programme élargi de subvention canadienne euh, salariale avec ce que vous proposez comme élargissement? OK. M. Morneau. Merci. Euh, C'est une question importante, bien sûr. Nous sommes maintenant en train d'assurer les employeurs que la subvention salariale va être là jusqu'à la fin d'août. Ça, c'est important pour leur planning. Euh, mais comme j'ai dit, nous allons considérer les ajustements. Donc aujourd'hui, je ne peux pas dire exactement avec précision euh, nos, euh, nos estimations. Mais quand nous avons plus d'informations, bien sûr, nous allons euh, introduire euh, les, les chiffres appropriés. Okay, puis, euh, oui, c'est ça, mais c'est euh, sur un autre sujet encore pour M. Morneau. Je voudrais savoir euh, concernant les, les transferts en santé aux provinces. Vous savez comme moi que leur budget de santé va exploser avec euh, la situation qu'on vit présentement. Êtes-vous ouvert à hausser les transferts en santé, à les faire passer à 6 And Bill, before you answer that question, there's a request here from the reporters in Ottawa that you repeat your reply to the first question in English, please. Do I have to remember my reply to the first question? Is that it? <laughs> the, uh, the first question was about the, uh, the wage subsidy and the, our expectations on costs. And as I mentioned, uh, first and foremost, we want to give assurance to businesses that the wage subsidy will be extended to the end of August. That gives them the ability to rehire workers to do their planning with some sense of security. That said, we are looking to potentially make adjustments to the program to make sure it encourages hiring. So with those adjustments, which we are going to consult on, uh, still to come, I can't yet make uh, precise estimates on the costs, the implications. Um, pour la question uh, au sujet de, de notre approche de travailler avec les provinces, c'est clair qu'on va avoir des, les coûts uh, uh, et uh, les, les choses difficiles uh, à cause de la COVID-19. Et les, les coûts pour notre système de santé est une des choses uh, qui va être très importante dans, dans nos, nos prochaines discussions. 
Donc, euh, quand on a une, euh, une possibilité de parler avec les provinces, on va considérer comment nous pouvons travailler ensemble. Mais bien sûr, euh, il, il reste une situation où les juridictions des, des provinces et des gouvernements fédérales euh, sont claires. Et euh, de cette façon, on va avoir les, les débats, on va avoir les discussions et on va travailler ensemble pour euh, assurer les Canadiens que notre système fonctionne et on a assez de fonds pour euh, assurer que nous pouvons continuer de, de confronter le COVID-19. Et je pourrais ajouter juste que cette question de, de l'écoute euh, de, euh, dans la lutte contre la COVID-19 était discutée entre le premier ministre et les premiers ministres des provinces et territoires euh, hier soir. Euh, et le premier ministre a, a souligné encore une fois que le fédéral est là pour aider les provinces et les territoires euh, dans leur travail contre le COVID-19, incluant dans les questions très importantes des dépistages. Merci, Madame la vice-première ministre. Opérateur, prochaine question, s'il vous plaît. Merci. The next question is from Mike Blanchfield from the Canadian Press. Please go ahead. Yes, hi, good afternoon. Uh, this question is for Dr. Tam and perhaps the Deputy Prime Minister as well. Um, given the discussions with the provinces on uh, stepping up a more coordinated approach on contact tracing and its importance, obviously, in uh, rebooting the economy, um, what is the urgency? What urgency do you feel about getting a national plan in place to deal with contact tracing? And um, when do you see that taking shape? And what will it look like? Yes, so contact tracing is one of the absolute cornerstones of um, our public health uh, strategy going forwards. Contact tracing is, of course, done at a local level with um, support uh, as needed from uh, the provincial and federal levels. So I think from a... Um, and, and in general, that is done by uh, public health um, staff or officials, augment, augmented now by uh, some of the increased capacity uh, that have been um, put in place by different jurisdictions. Some of them have hired, uh, say, students and other surge capacities as well. Uh, the federal government is continuing, well, we are offering uh, additional support as needed on that front. Uh, there have been a number of discussions about um, technological applications. There are some jurisdictions that have uh, began to try some of this um, and sharing some of the lessons. I do know that there's been further discussions, I think, at, a, at, at the ministerial level. Yeah, and I can just add, Mike, it's a really good question. And as you will have seen in the readout uh, from the call between the first ministers last night, testing and contact tracing and working together on that uh, was one of the main issues discussed. Uh, there was a real enthusiasm of all of the first ministers and, of course, of the prime minister for us as a country to really continue to step up testing and contact tracing and a real shared recognition that doing that is very important as we look towards reopening our economy. Um, there was some discussion of the collaboration that is already happening. For example, uh, this week, uh, the federal government has been working with Ontario to provide some specific support, just some people on contact tracing, and that's going well. Um, and then Premier Mo made a point, uh, speaking on behalf of the Council of Federation, which people really agreed with, which is as we reopen the economy, we are going to see more Canadians traveling between provinces. And so there will be more of a need for us across the country to collaborate on contact tracing. That was a point that the premiers raised. And so we did talk about ways uh, that we're all going to need to work even more closely together on that. Follow up, Mike. If I may. Please, Nav. Thank you very much. Just quickly to add on what Christia said uh, with respect to uh, contact tracing. One other element that's very important 
is not only are we working with the provinces and territories, not only are we engaging with different organizations, but privacy will be central. Uh, the architecture around privacy principles will be a key feature of any tool that we uh, work with and move forward on. So I wanted to highlight the importance of making sure that as we look at other jurisdictions, we want to be driven by a Canadian solution based on Canadian values, and privacy will be front and center. Mike, follow up. Yeah, okay. Uh, for the Deputy Prime Minister, U.S. media reports indicate the Trump administration wants its border restrictions to have an indefinite timeline. Are they asking for the current that current non-essential travel, uh, the ban between Canada and the U.S., are they asking it to be extended beyond June 21st? And if so, is Canada pushing back on that? Uh, so, as you know, Mike, I never think it's a good idea to uh, disclose uh, private negotiations. I think it's never good to negotiate in public. But let me just assure Canadians that decisions about the Canadian border are going to be taken by Canadians in the Canadian national interest with the health and safety of Canadians first and foremost. Our government is taking a very prudent approach. And in that, the Canada-U.S. border was discussed by the first ministers yesterday also. And there was, I would say, a widely shared view expressed by the premiers that taking a prudent approach right now is the right thing. Uh, we are actively discussing with the United States what to do uh, next on the Canada-U.S. border. It is a very, very collegial and very friendly conversation. And I think it would be absolutely fair to say that both sides feel the current measures are working really, really well in restricting non-essential travel, but also really importantly for both countries in ensuring that essential travel continues. Uh, and that will be particularly important as we look towards the reopening of our economy for areas like the auto sector, for example. So the essential travel is still happening. Both countries feel very comfortable with that. Thank you, Deputy Prime Minister. Operator, next question, please. Thank you. The next question, la prochaine question, is from the Bureau of Radio Canada. Have the parole. Bonjour, Madame Freeland. Radio-Canada a publié l'histoire d'une Canadienne enceinte qui a voulu rentrer au Canada avec son mari américain, mais elle a été refoulée à la frontière. Puis on a plein d'exemples comme celui-là. Selon les décrets de votre gouvernement, les proches des citoyens canadiens ont le droit d'entrer au Canada si leur voyage n'est pas optionnel ou discrétionnaire, comme le tourisme et les loisirs. Mais l'Agence des services frontaliers, CBSC, dit plutôt que leur voyage doit être essentiel. Comment vous expliquez que l'agence applique un critère plus restrictif que ce qu'on trouve dans vos décrets, en français et en anglais, s'il vous plaît? Merci pour la question. Euh, et je sais qu'il y a des cas comme ça. Euh, et je sais que toutes ces situations sont spécifiques et chaque situation est importante et difficile pour les familles, pour les personnes touchées par cette situation. Euh, je dois dire aussi que euh, pour les gens qui travaillent euh, à la frontière, les agents frontalières, euh, c'est un moment difficile. Chaque agent frontalière doit prendre des décisions spécifiques dans les cas spécifiques. Mais je voudrais dire aussi que notre gouvernement pense que c'est important d'avoir une approche euh, qui comprenne les situations particulières des familles, euh, qui comprenne euh, les, les besoins euh, familiales aussi. Uh, so let me just say that we are aware of situations like the one you describe, and, you know, our government uh, is very, very aware of how difficult these situations can be for families, uh, for the people who are involved. Um, for our border agents, I think we also have to remember that this is a unique situation where they are charged with, on the one hand, stopping non-essential travel 
keeping Canadians safe. Let's remember we are living in a time of physical distancing here at home where we're encouraging everyone here at home in Canada to move around as little as possible. Uh, And at the same time, they have the job of ensuring that essential travel can happen. So it's a lot of very difficult, very specific decisions the border agents have to make. I will say as a government, we do encourage them to very much take into account the specific situations of specific families, of specific Canadians, and where possible to take a compassionate approach. And where families are having specific difficulties, I encourage them to get in touch with us, to get in touch with their local MPs. And on a case-by-case basis, we can definitely look at what's happening. Madame Bureau, en suivi. Oui, Madame Freeland, euh, il semble y avoir quand même des messages contradictoires. On dit à la frontière, les, les voyages doivent être essentiels. Mais sur le site du gouvernement du Canada, le regroupement familial en ces temps difficiles de pandémie était reconnu comme un motif acceptable pour entrer à la frontière. Est-ce que votre gouvernement a changé d'idée? Notre position n'a pas changé. On a dit du début, du moment que on a pris cette décision et qu'on a mis à place les mesures. On a dit que le but était de limiter les voyages non essentiels et en même temps de permettre les voyages essentiels. Euh, je pense que c'est très important de comprendre que cette euh, c'est une chose très difficile à faire euh, et que en général on a réussi à d'une côté limiter beaucoup les voyages et c'est très important pour la santé des Canadiens et Canadiennes et d'autre côté les voyages essentiels continuent euh, on a des choses à, des on a des choses à manger dans nos épiceries. Notre économie continue à fonctionner grâce à les voyages essentiels. Alors, en général, les mesures fonctionnent. Je sais qu'il y a des problèmes spécifiques et on va essayer de les résoudre. Merci, Madame la Vice-Première Ministre. On va tourner à la room pour prendre des questions, commencer avec Kelsey de Reuters. Um, thank you very much for taking my questions. Uh, they're both for Minister Morneau. And Minister Morneau, if you wouldn't mind speaking close to the mic, that would be much appreciated. The audio is still a bit fuzzy. Um, so I'd, my first question is, I'd like to follow up on the first question about how much the extension of the wage subsidy will cost. I can appreciate that there are adjustments that are still to be made to the program, but you must have some rough idea as to how much this extension would cost. And we're also looking for an updated figure on the total stimulus that has been provided uh, by the Canadian government thus far for the COVID situation, please. Can't hear you, you at all. For the, I, I think it's really, Can you hear me now? We can, but it's cutting in and out. Okay, well, I apologize for the uh, audio. Um, I'll speak loudly. We've uh, made sure to be giving information to uh, the Finance Committee and to the House of Commons. Uh, yesterday, I delivered a report to the Finance Committee outlining our direct measures at $151.7 billion. This is, as we know, significant support for Canadians and for Canadian businesses to get through this time. With respect to the wage subsidy, the um, extension to the end of August is, is really about supporting people and uh, supporting a broad range of businesses as they try to get back to, uh, to work in a, in a careful way. Uh, we will be able to provide more information on the exact costs of that as we work through the details of adjustments that we make. But until we've done the consultation and c- considered the adjustments, uh, we don't have the information to give you a precise figure. Um, sorry, so the audio is very fuzzy. So I think you said 151 million as the total cost. And then as a follow-up, 
you you have said that it is too soon to say when we will have a date for a fiscal update or a budget, but one of your uh, finance officials told the finance committee this week that there was work ongoing on a fiscal update. So I'm wondering how you jive these two positions. Uh, Minister, you're now. Can you hear us, Bill? I, uh, it's, it's difficult, but I, I got the thrust of the okay. question. So, yes, I'm happy to respond. Okay, and Bill, I'm going to just week. ask um, you, could you speak very slowly because the transmission is terrible? So if you speak slowly and loudly, our chances of understanding you will, I hope, improve. I, I'm sorry, Minister. We we can't hear you at all. Okay, here's what I'm going to suggest, Bill. We can't hear you. So, Kelsey, would you mind? We will go on to Mike's question. We'll, it's also for Bill. Okay. What's our technical view? Okay, so we're going to turn the video off and then try it again. Okay, we're going to turn you guys off. Sorry. And then we're going to turn you back on. Okay. (laughs) Okay. In the meantime, Julie, do you have a non-Bill or Nav question? I think we'll just get the ministers on the phone ASAP, but we can take Julie's question in the meantime. Um, I, I had some questions for Mr. Morneau, too, but I do have a question for Dr. Tam from our health unit, and it's about the studies that are being done on COVID and obesity. Apparently, there's been some in the States that in, if you're obese, that your chances of being harder hit with COVID are there. Now, do you, are there any Canadian studies? What do you think of the link between obesity and COVID and the severity of COVID? Yeah, so that that has been a, a observation, and I think um, I, I think um, a, a enough of an observation that we need to absolutely look at the relationship between uh, obesity and the severity. Uh, we do see that, and, and in fact, that was one of the observations very early on when uh, we had the last pandemic of H one N one was it was something that we weren't really aware of, and and, and again. With COVID-19, this observation has been made. It could also be linked with other um, comorbidities or other uh, medical conditions as well. And so I think um, oh, this is uh, worthy of uh, continuing uh, to uh, analyze that. But we absolutely, I think, is one of the conditions that, uh, for which clinical information needs to be collected. Okay. Julie, no follow-up? <laughs> We're just going to give it a few minutes, seconds, but, hopefully. But I could ask Dr. Tam, are there any studies being done in Canada on this, the link between obesity and uh, the severity at which COVID hits you if you're obese? Um, I'm not aware of a specific study, but it's uh, one of the sort of um, clinical features that uh, it needs to be it's collected um, as part of... Um, Um, the data in Canada. But um, as you all know, we've had some gaps in our data. So I I don't know about the robustness of of that information. But I think um, this is best also studied in the sort of clinical sector as well, not just the public health domain, but uh, in the clinical domain. And I'll just add, Julie, um, we may be able to get back to you with the nature of some of the clinical research that's happening through the Canadian Institute for Health Research. There has been a number of uh, grants uh, for both clinical research and and sort of sociological research associated with COVID-19. And so we'll get back to you with some of the nature of some of those uh, clinical research grants that we've approved through CIHR. Thank you, Minister. I don't think we're quite ready yet. So are there any other questions for... People that are physically in the room. Okay. okay. I'm going to suggest, Carl, if we can get them on the phone. I think that's, that's, that's what we are trying to do right now, I think. To get them on the phone? Yep. Okay. So I'm just going to give it a few minutes. Apologies for that. Can we ask some other questions? Can we just like 
some free shots on goal? <laughs> I think that we have to let our reporter friends ask more questions if they wish. Minister Mortimer okay. is back on. Bill, can you say a few words, Bill, just so that we can see if we can hear you? Okay. Clearly, Bill can't hear us, so. <laughs> I think we'll just pause and resume in a few minutes. So, Kelsey, Julie, Mike, if you guys have another question or two, you can ask one. I just, I have a curiosity. Um, <laughs> <laughs> if, if we have time, I'm wondering how, how, Dr. Tim, you suggest to those who are working in essential services and who have been working very long hours for the last couple of months to keep the economy going and, and to, to maintain the health care system, how do you deal with the potential of burnout? And, and avoid that. Um, I'm sure um, Minister Haiju, who's very much a supporter of maintaining mental health, will have something to say, is absolutely a major issue for sure. I think healthcare workers will be working this long hours, not just healthcare workers, other, many other essential services, uh, people who keep many supplies going. And I think, um, I think there are many programs set up um, for em employees, if you're part of those programs, you know, take um, take the most advantage of it, um, for sure. Um, the minister may want to talk about the sort of suite of applications that we have, but it is really difficult. I mean, it's, it's a matter of individuals being supported by their families, by their communities, uh, by the work environment they work in, um, as well as getting help when needed. I have to say, as a health worker, and perhaps someone who's been working many hours, we're not very good sometimes at asking for help. I know doctors are not very good at all in spotting our own uh, you know, health needs. So I think um, we also need to be able to to our colleagues, I always say to my staff, you know, if I'm behaving strangely, would you please tell me? Because I'm, <laughs> I might not actually know myself. And, and, that, and, and behaviors that are out of the ordinary for me uh, affects how everybody else works in my team. So I think partly uh, a, a few days earlier, I think uh, during um, sort of mental health week, I said, you know, you got to kind of talk about how you feel, which is not easy for many. Um, health workers in particular feel that they have to help others and sometimes neglect to sort of help themselves. So we have to be aware of that as well. Okay. Thank you, Doctor. I'm told we now have Minister Baines and Minister Morno on the phone. So, Kelsey, follow up. Uh, thank you very much, and I appreciate the patience. Um, Minister Morno, if you could please repeat the figure that you gave for the total um, amount of stimulus, that would be much appreciated as the line cut out. And then as a follow-up, we're wondering, um, you have said that there is, uh, you, it's too early to give a fiscal update or budget at this point, but one of your finance officials told the committee this week that there was work ongoing on a fiscal update, so I'm just wondering how you jive those two positions. Well, thank you, and I can hear you clearly now. I hope you can hear me clearly. It's uh, much better. Thank you. So I was uh, responding to your first question around the scale of our direct support, and as I reported to the Finance Committee in the House of Commons yesterday, the uh, report on the direct support is at $151.7 billion. Obviously, enormous support for Canadians as we try to get through this time and significant support for businesses to find a way to get across a, a difficult period. With respect to the um, provision of information, obviously we are being 
being transparent as we announce new programs to make sure we give a sense of the uh, expectations of the cost of those programs. Uh, you heard one of my finance officials this week talk about our need to be constantly ready to provide uh, fiscal updates. We're constantly consulting with business and with industry to get a good sense of where our economy is going. Uh, that said, we want to make sure that the situation is more stable before we give uh, an outline of, of a fiscal update. We're in a very fluid situation, and uh, as we have a more stable situation from which to provide uh, economic uh, forecasts, we will come forward with those forecasts, which we think is appropriate. Thank you, Minister. Julie, follow-up. Uh, Mr. Morneau, Julie Van Dusen, CBC. Um, so there was a huge uptake on this on the CERB, the two thousand dollar a month benefit, not so much on the wage subsidy. And I'm wondering, is as the economy starts to reopen a little bit, is the CERB a disincentive in that some people might um, rather stay at home? Maybe they're too afraid to to go to work, or maybe they're being offered less than the than the CERB offers at two thousand dollars a month. This is an important, uh, an important question, and it's something that we're working on. Uh, the one correction I'd make is that both programs have had really significant impact. We've had, as you know, more than 7.5 million people that have gone on to the emergency response benefit. But we've also had uh, millions of people through their employers uh, apply through the wage subsidy. So we see both of these programs as very important to support uh, employees uh, and people. And uh, as we move forward, we are exactly, as you said, trying to make sure that there's an incentive for an employer to uh, keep their employees on or to rehire workers as we uh, carefully open up. And at the same time, we want to make sure that there's support for people who are facing the challenge of not being at work. So we're, we're going to work towards this extension of the wage subsidy appropriately and uh, obviously have to look at how that relates to the emergency response benefit and our employment insurance system. That work's ongoing. Thank you, Minister. Molly? Mr. Bono, Molly Thomas, CTV National News. Uh, I'm just going to follow up on Julie's question there. Um, only 3.36 billion has been paid out of a 70 billion dollar wage subsidy program. So, was this the wrong path to supporting workers? Thank you. Uh, we, we think this was uh, exactly the right path and exactly the right approach. So the idea was the emergency response benefit had to go out first because we have 5.7 million out of the 19 million workers in Canada not actually attached to employers. So we wanted to make sure we supported those individuals. But the wage subsidy we see is critically important for businesses to retain the relationship with their employees. So uh, what you're seeing is that that program is uh, being rolled out. The uh, program started on April 27th, and uh, employers have been signing up at a rapid pace. Uh, so you will see more uh, funding through that program come uh, as, that, uh, as that is rolled out to more employers. And as we said today, the extension, which we think is so important, will enable us to continue to support people and uh, enable us to get to get carefully back to work, providing the appropriate level of support to, uh, to make that happen. So I just, Molly, hang on 30 seconds. Um, someone who is on one of our phone lines is not on mute. So if I could urge everyone who's part of this uh, exciting festival of openness and transparency to be sure that they are on mute unless they are intending to speak. Please, Molly. Um, Minister Marneau, so beyond the extension, then how are you going to get more businesses on board? Because it seems like there's this huge amount of money there, but people aren't tapping in, or is it just that um, businesses are folding in our country? They can't. They don't even need this. I, I would say that, uh, that it's really neither of those two things. What's happening is as the program has been up now for a couple of weeks, we're seeing employers come on board. And the extension will give people a greater sense of confidence that they can plan as they move forward to use the wage subsidy. So that's the reason we're moving forward in this regard. I think that uh, we will certainly see uh, businesses decide that this is appropriate for their situation. And in some other businesses, they may, they may not. And that will be a decision that they'll each individually need to take based on their expectations for their, their business. 
But we think it's a very important support mechanism. We think it will enable us to get back to work uh, more rapidly and protect people and protect businesses to, uh, to be able to, to deal with this challenge. Okay. Mike, we're going to take your question before we go back to the phone, okay. just to prevent any further technical All issues. Right. Mr. Morneau, as companies start to reopen, uh, their revenues may increase, but not to the levels they were before. Um, so what will precisely change with the eligibility threshold for the wage subsidy to ensure companies can feel like they're not being penalized for opening their doors? Thank you. In fact, that, that's, the, that's the perfect question. And what we're, what we're saying is that moving from a situation where we essentially asked businesses to be locked down to a situation where we're gradually reopening means we need to consider adjustments to these programs. And that's what we intend on doing. Uh, we will be talking to uh, businesses and to uh, labor leaders to think about the best way that we can support businesses as they move to this gradual reopening. We don't want the programs that we have to have a disincentive for those businesses to rehire workers. In fact, it's what we're seeking is the opposite, that they do rehire workers and that they do carefully get back to business. So we'll be looking at those uh, incentives and disincentives in the coming uh, days and weeks in order to provide more clarity for businesses on how this extension through and until the end of August can support their business now and as they move forward. Say you are on the CERB right now, you're, you're getting it, you're getting about the money, and then you, if you were to go back to work, you get a lot, le a lot less money. What is your, like, why would people go onto the wage subsidy and not just stay at home on their CERB? I think that, uh, as, I, as I just mentioned, we do need to carefully look at how these programs work together. Uh, the, the straightforward answer is that the CERB is $500 a week and that the wage subsidy goes up to $847 a week, uh, meaning that uh, there is incentive for people to be on the wage subsidy and there's incentive for employers to move their employees onto the wage subsidy to the extent that that pay would mean that they'd get more than $500 per week. That said, we are looking carefully at the relationship between these two benefits so that as we move into a, a reopening phase, that we have the right incentives and the right support, the support for workers that they need and the support for businesses so that they can get back to work appropriately. Merci, Monsieur le Ministre. On va prendre deux questions au téléphone. Opérateur. Thank you. Merci. The next question, la prochaine question, est de Émilie Bergeron de l'agence KMI. À vous la parole. Oui, bonjour. Ma question pour M. Morneau. Euh, les, 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 le taux d'inscription à la subvention salariale n'est pas aussi élevé que ce que vous euh, espériez. Euh, on avait vu avec la PCU que le nombre de demandes avait été euh, instantanément euh, assez fulgurant. Ce n'est pas la même chose pour la subvention salariale. Est-ce que ça a contribué à vous convaincre d'élargir l'accès? Merci pour la question. Euh, C'est une bonne question. La subvention salariale est, est une euh, approche importante pour, euh, pour protéger euh, les gens, mais aussi pour assurer les entreprises qu'ils vont avoir une possibilité d'avoir une pente d'ici à la fin de la crise. Donc, avec une, euh, une situation où on va avoir euh, une continuation de la subvention salariale, on, on, on va avoir plus de confiance pour les employeurs pour leur planning, et ça, c'est très important. De cette façon, ils vont considérer la subvention salariale comme importante pour leur affaire. Donc, ça, c'est notre approche. On doit considérer les ajustements, parce qu'avec un une, euh, une changement dans la situation dans notre économie, avec, avec un une, euh, une changement graduel d'être... Euh, euh, dans une situation plus normale, c'est nécessaire de, de considérer les ajustements pour, pour avoir la, la continuation de, de l'utilisation de la subvention salariale avec peut-être plus de revenus pour une, une entreprise. Émilie, en suivi merci. Oui, merci. Euh, oui, en suivi, euh, vous avez parlé dans votre ouverture de euh, discussion avec 
avec euh, les, le milieu des affaires et avec les syndicats au cours du prochain mois. Euh, Est-ce que c'est pas un peu tard, euh, compte tenu qu'il y a des entreprises euh, qui, euh, qui en sont plus à une question de jour pour leur survie qu'une question de mois, d'avoir des consultations pendant un mois? Est-ce que c'est pas risqué? Merci. Euh, si j'ai dit pendant des mois, c'était une erreur. Donc, on va avoir les discussions pendant les prochains jours avec, euh, avec les entreprises, avec les, euh, les chefs de, des syndicats. Ça, c'est très important pour considérer les aj ajustements. Donc, la continuation de le programme va être jusqu'à la fin d'août. On va avoir plus de détails sur les, les ajustements possibles. Uh, beaucoup plus court que ça. Donc, uh, une, une discussion pendant les prochains jours, peut-être une semaine ou deux, mais plus d'informations très bientôt. Merci, Monsieur le ministre. Operator, last question, please. Thank you. Our last question, la dernière question, is from Christopher Nardi from the National Post. Please go ahead. Hi, good afternoon. Um, this question is also for um, Minister Morneau. Minister Morneau, you um, mentioned earlier that you'll be expanding uh, criteria to uh, various other organizations, including, um, you know, private schools, the National Ballet School you mentioned specifically. Um, what happened in the first iteration of the legislation that all of these organizations were excluded on what all of them essentially called technicalities, like the National Ballet School, for example, who said they were excluded pretty much simply because they had the word school in their name in a very small academic program? Why were they originally excluded in the first place? I think uh, the, uh, the approach we've taken on, uh, on the wage subsidy, on the emergency response benefit, on the emergency business account, in each case has been attempting to get to programs that can support the broadest number of Canadians as possible. So you're seeing the outcome of that on the emergency response benefit, more than seven and a half people supported the emergency business account, now more than 600,000 loans. What we've said all along is that we, we recognize that rolling out policies this rapidly means that we might not get everything perfect on the first iteration, but we will rapidly come back and, and make changes as, as required. And what you're seeing today is that we recognize that uh, because of the design and the, the rapid legislation, there's some things that we needed to fix. And one of them is that there are some organizations that were uh, ineligible just because of the nature of, of their organization. Uh, but they've experienced the same 30% revenue drop. So this is about protecting people that are working for organizations that are going through a big and challenging time. And uh, you've seen that we recognize that driving schools or art schools or, uh, or a ballet school have had that revenue drop but, but don't have the uh, access to the wage subsidy. So, so this is a, a fix. Uh, we will continue to look at, at challenges, work together with other parties in the House of Commons to address those challenges if legislation is required so that we can support the broadest number of Canadians possible during a really challenging time. Mr. Nardi, follow up? And uh, you mentioned earlier as well that your, your government is looking at that 30% minimum um, revenue drop in order to be eligible for the wage subsidy. Uh, can you go on a bit about that? Is it, is it too stringent for certain organizations? And what percentages could you possibly look to drop it or increase it, depending on what you're looking at? I really don't have a, a, an appropriate answer for you at this at this time. We think that as we uh, move quickly to a new phase, we need to we need to take considered decisions. Those decisions will not be extended over a long period of time, but they require some consultation in order to make sure we get it right. So in the coming days, we will be doing that work. We will be thinking about how we can extend this program appropriately. We've committed to businesses that it will be extended till the end of August, giving some sense of confidence that they can use the wage subsidy sign-up if they already haven't, but uh, make sure that we get it right. So as we have more details, we will certainly uh, come out with them, uh, but for now we're, we're going to continue our analysis and have more to say in the coming days. Okay. Uh, avant de partir, je voudrais juste remercier tous les journalistes. Uh, pour votre patience avec les problèmes techniques aujourd'hui, mais aussi pour votre travail acharné tous les jours. Um, 
before we leave, I just really wanted to thank all the journalists here in the room in Ottawa and on the phone for your patience with our technical difficulties today, but also for your really hard work every day. I was on a call a few days ago with an international group of epidemiologists, and one thing they pointed out was how important the work of journalists is in an effective response to the coronavirus. And I really agree with them, and so I just want to say thank you very much and have a great long weekend.